Uh, good evening, everyone, and I want to thank all the panelists uh, for participating in tonight's discussion about housing choices in Acton. And as, as Bob talked about, um, I did chair on the, in the legislature on the Senate side the Joint Committee on Housing, and I also uh, chaired the Acton Housing Authority uh, when I uh, was first getting back to Acton after law school. So I've uh, been very involved in, in the housing discussion and, you know, be the first to say that, you know, in suburban communities it can be um, a sensitive issue. Um, but I, I, I guess I would just say a few perspectives that, that really highlights to me the need to have this discussion and, and, you know, hopefully to come to a consensus for a vision for Acton is, you know, first of all, I think about, you know, myself growing up in Acton and, you know, when, when I was born, my parents lived at the Strawberry Hill Apartments. So that's where I was born, at the Strawberry Hill Apartments. And then a couple years later, my parents were able to afford a home where, where I spent you know, the rest of my life till I went off to college um, without having, um, oh, is that my phone? Without having, um, my apologies, without having um, that option, you know, it, it, it might not have had the, the opportunity to begin in the Acton Public Schools. Um, district perspective. Um, I represent 14 communities. I would say about 10% of the time of my, my state house staff are focused on people in a housing crisis. So they can't afford rent, um, so they're, you know, they're being evicted, trying to get them placed, um, having discussions about um, how, um, sorry about that, it's my phone making, uh, having, um, having discussions about um, how to plan other communities' discussions around uh, housing opportunities in the district I represent. The district I represent, there are many large corporations, there's strong economic development, and yet if we're not providing a wide variety of housing options, um, I think that it's going to be more and more difficult to attract companies to this area and for the, the general sustainability of our very strong economy. And you're hearing more and more business presidents, owners, corporations say that they like everything about Massachusetts except for the high cost of housing. So, you know, having that discussion. And just to sort of put a very specific point on it, and I actually did a couple of Facebook posts about it because there was no other way to help this couple. But about two weeks ago, a couple from Boxboro, uh, who, be, because they've been very public about it, uh, the, the fiance is a U.S. military veteran, unfortunately uh, has post-traumatic stress disorder, his fiance, they lived in Boxboro. They could no longer afford to live in Boxboro. Um, I helped them uh, get into an apartment in Lowell, except they could not raise the money to pay for both security deposit and first month's rent. So when you think of the average sort of working family or working class person, they might be able to afford that first month's rent, but when you add on top of that the security deposit, it's a serious barrier. And so in the age they were living in, I helped them create a GoFundMe page and to raise the money to, to pay for that security deposit. Unfortunately, they did not have a place to live for two weeks. So I will be the first to tell you tonight that one night they did uh, stay overnight in my campaign office. Um, two nights they slept in their car in the Kmart right down the street here in Acton. And a couple other nights some veterans organizations were kind enough to get them motel rooms uh, in the Tewksbury area. So, you know, that is a box for a couple that, you know, these are, these are our, our residents, if you will. There are residents in this area that have these challenges. Um, and if not, you know, for the different levels of support they got, um, I really, really worry about where they would be right now. Um, my final comment is just that I think sometimes when the discussion is about affordable housing, um, it's just about low-income families, and obviously, you know, that is a priority, but it's also about seniors. Um, I know that there's a recent proposal that's before the Zoning Boards of Appeal that is a 100% uh, senior housing proposal uh, for, for Mass Ave um, that just recently had a hearing. Um, the biggest demographic in Massachusetts, the biggest growing demographic, are senior citizens. So what are we going to do to provide options for senior citizens that are on a modest income but want to remain in the community that they raised their kids, that they gave back to, that, that, they, that they perhaps grew up in? And then the, the last category is um, helping the disabled. And I think that's another group that often people aren't thinking about that group. Uh, that demographic when we're talking about affordable housing is that there's really limited options for those who are disabled. Um, the, the legislature's uh, budget just passed last week 
And one of, the, one of my big areas of focus is the Alternative Housing Voucher Program, AHVP. We've increased that to $6 million, which will provide about 100 more vouchers. But that's 100 more vouchers across the state for people who are disabled. So those are very coveted uh, vouchers. Um, so you know, I'm hoping eventually for the state to step up to provide more support, but communities on their own can also do their part uh, to provide more support, including for those uh, who are disabled and need housing. So I just sort of wanted to give you a landscape and perspective. I won't go into detail about some of the other uh, state policies that are going on in Beacon Hill right now, uh, but um, I'm happy to discuss that later. And once again, I want to thank the panelists here. I really look forward to a positive discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator Eldridge. And now it's my pleasure to introduce um, Dana LeWinter, who is the Municipal Engagement Director for Citizens Housing and Planning Association and has been working with us here in Acton over the last few months. And Dana will moderate the rest of the panel. Uh, Dana served as Director of Housing for the City of Somerville and is Executive Director of the Basque Community and, Blank and Banking Council before taking on her current role at Citizens Housing and Planning. So, Dana. Can folks hear me? Good, okay. So um, thank you very much, Bob, and thank you, uh, Senator Eldridge, for, for your remarks as well. Um, so as Bob said, I'm the Director of Municipal Engagement at Citizens Housing and Planning Association. Um, we're a statewide organization that works to foster diverse and sustainable communities through planning and community development. Um, and I believe, as I think all of you believe, that everyone in Acton deserves an affordable place to call home, yet many seniors, families, people who work here can't afford to live here. Um, and as you'll hear from the speakers tonight, um, as an example, more than one in four Acton households spend more than 30% of their income on housing. So to address the housing crisis in this community, a group of residents and local organizations in Acton have been um, meeting together, coming together to determine goals and discuss some strategies for increasing affordable housing production in Acton. Um, and with CHAPA's support, they're working to build um, local support for housing development and affordable housing that meets the needs of this community. Um, and the goals of this work really include supporting the efforts of, of what's happening in Acton to build a culture that welcomes housing, including affordable housing, um, bolstering the efforts of, of what you all are doing here to expand housing opportunities in Acton, and growing the number of people supporting housing production here. I'm really excited to see what Acton can, can achieve, um, having met uh, the wonderful people who are doing this work here. Um, so the goal of tonight's forum is to hear from these speakers uh, about the housing need in the state, the region, but more specifically locally here in Acton, to learn about some existing housing options that are out there, and, and begin to explore some strategies for meeting the ongoing housing needs of Acton's residents. Um, I want to stress this is just the beginning of, a, of an important conversation on how Acton can be a place to call home for all. Um, so I'll walk you through the agenda. We've done welcomes and introductions. Uh, we've, we've already ticked one off the block. Um, we're going to hear a little bit about the state and regional housing demand, and then we'll hear about Acton's housing story, getting into the local level. We'll hear what Acton is doing and what can be done uh, to address the housing crisis, and then we the housing needs. And then we'll have uh, plenty of time for questions and answers, and I'll um, give some parameters for how we'll handle that at, after the speakers have uh, had a chance to speak. So very quickly, I'll introduce the speakers because they will um, their remarks will, will speak for themselves. But we have uh, Chris Clutchman here. She's the director of the Massachusetts Housing Choice Program uh, for the state. We have Judy Barrett from the Barrett Planning Group. We have Kelly Cronin, who's the executive director of the Acton Housing Authority. And we have Nancy Tavernier, who's the chairman of the Acton Community Housing Corporation. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to uh, Chris to tell us a little bit about the housing needs in the region. Thank you so much, Dana. Um, I'm going to talk about the Housing Choice Initiative, which is a, a gen, uh, initiative of the Baker Polito administration. And what I start my presentations with is people. Because after all, we're made up of people. We're not just kind of numbers. I am going to have some demographics and some other numbers and some charts. Um, I'm hoping that um, 
somebody is going to post a, a copy of the presentation because a lot of the charts you know, are going to go by relatively quickly, and so I want you to have a chance to see that. But um, we, as Senator Aldrich mentioned, um, seniors are a growing demographic, and we need you know, these seniors who are hostage at a public meeting that I did about 10 years ago. Um, that's who we're planning for. Uh, the lovely young woman in the Christmas decoration, that was my mom. She just passed away last year at age 94, but she's an example of a, somebody who lived well past 85, so you know, really into her elder years, who needed special housing treatment. We have millennials, like uh, the teacher who is next to my son. Um, I live in a uh, community in Lexington um, on 128, and Lexington isn't building a lot of new housing, and she's a school teacher there, and I know she could not afford to rent or to live in the community in which she taught, and that's a shame. So again, just demographics. Let's talk a little bit about who these generations are. We've got the baby boomers. Of course, we have people who are before the baby boomers, so apologies if you're in that category. But in general, we're going to talk a lot about the baby boomers. Generation X and Y are kind of these middle generations. Generation Z, we also call the millennials. Um, that's kind of the echo of the baby boom. Um, and I really like this because I can't get my kids to pick up. We say, use the phone feature, and they're saying, no, I'm going to only text you. So we're kind of different, um, those of us who are born in these different generations. So this is an animated slide that is going through years. So if you watch in the upper right-hand side, you're going to see the years passing by. And you see that big bump there? That's a tsunami. We call it the silver tsunami. That's the baby boom. This is the ages. We started at 5, and we end at over 85 here. And so that's as we're going through we're in the 2000s now. They're getting older. We're going to stop at 2016, and then it's going to repeat itself. So now I'm going to... Now that you get what's going on, let me point some things out. So just look at this top bar is in 1970, how many people were um, in that 50 to 54 age bracket. And when we get to 2016, take a look at how many more seniors there are now than there were in 1970. And as I pointed out about my mom, we live in this great community of Boston. We've got lots of great medical care. Many people are living longer lives. So not only do we have a bigger senior population, but this eight, over 85, look at how many more people there are over 85. So this is for the state as a whole. Um, if you see that other little bump, that's the baby, uh, that's the millennials. That's that echo of the baby boom. So um, we are definitely all getting older, and there's a lot of people who are getting older. I had um, folks take a look at the magic region. Um, that is, Acton is in that subregion of the Boston metro area. It includes Littleton, uh, Lexington. It's kind of the um, Minuteman corridor, I think they call it. Um, and so I'll show you those towns in a second. But just to compare your age range to the state, the state's age range is shown here in yellow. And if you look at the magic area, again, this kind of your, your local region, it tends older. Look at how many fewer younger people there are. I think that might be, and I'm not, you know, other people are going to talk about Acton's demographics, but this region, it might be hard to get a starter home here, and so it might be harder to move here as a young family, um, and you might be somewhere else in the state when you have young kids or are younger yourself. So here's another way to look at this data. Um, here are the uh, magic communities. Um, Acton's kind of, it's organized by median age. Acton's kind of right in the middle. But to give you a sense, the statewide median age is 39 and a half years. So you, already you can see um, the whole region is, is older. And this is looking at, we've got a line on the left that's 25. And so everybody to the left of that is younger than 25. Line on the right is 65. So this kind of, these are peaks and valleys. These peaks, again, remember those the uh, millennials, I'm sorry, the baby boomers are getting older. Those are people who are going to be turning, um, going into retirement age. And so um, that also has implications for our workforce. Um, but again, this region does trend quite older. So talking about workforce, this is the state as a whole on the top. This is the labor force um, in dark blue, and people outside the labor force in light blue. Again, this is organized by age, with this kind of baby boom um, statewide kind of in the middle. But if you look at the magic region, which is older, you'll see how many more people that are towards the tail end of their careers. 
there aren't a lot of people that are following them that live here now. What that means is if our economy, not good, our economy is going to keep booming, uh, but we don't have the workers that live here in this region to replace them. What does that mean? That means people will hopefully move here to take those jobs, but those people don't live here yet. Those people don't have housing yet. So in addition to just people getting older and different kinds of housing, we also need to plan for housing for people who are going to move here who aren't even here yet. Uh, just to give you some quotes, Senator Eldridge mentioned this, the business community is very concerned uh, about um, the high cost of housing. Um, they are on board. Um, the Governor Baker, the Baker Polito administration has filed legislation to make some amendments to our zoning act to make it easier to change your zoning to build housing. Um, and many business um, organizations have supported that. Big hospitals, um, big organizations. But when I, um, they really care, and, and Senator Eldridge really hit it. When companies come to a town, they want to know not just where their executives can live, they want to know where all their workers can live. If all their workers have to live further out, then they're gonna, they may have transportation problems, and again, housing and transportation are, are linked, kind of hand in hand. But the, more, the further that people have to drive to get to their place of employment, because they can't afford it closer in, um, that's, that, it leads to problems with retention over, over a long period of time, and that's what they're concerned about. A little bit more data, and again, this is kind of from the statewide perspective and the Boston metro area perspective. The state um, as a whole has not been building enough housing. One of the main problems we have is supply and demand. One of the problems with not building enough housing is that people, especially young people, migrate to other places where they can look for housing that's more affordable. One way that you measure what's going on in the housing market is how many units are being built per thousand. And that's this chart that shows Boston, the Boston metro area in, in red. If you look here, it's not that great to see on the slides, but places like Austin, Denver, Seattle, Portland, you've heard of those kind of innovation hub places. Um, they have much higher building permits per thousand people as a metro area than we do. The chart on the bottom shows the net migration to those places. We are net, we are sending people away. So we are, the Boston metro area is losing population to those places. Those places are attracting um, more folks. Um, and so that is a, a problem for our own innovation economy when we're losing to these other places. Okay, let me talk a little bit, now I'm gonna get into some, again, regional housing issues. This is just looking at the, um, how many units are um, rental housing and how many units are for sale. The black is for sale and the yellow is rental. You're gonna have some more slides on this soon. You guys are on the lower side when compared to the state, but you're kinda in the middle of your region, but you know, about 23% of your units um, are rental, are available for rent, um, the rest for, for sale. Again, Senator Eldridge hit all of my talking points. It's really important to have a mix because, again, young families, um, it's a much less capital expenditure to do security deposit than it is to do a down payment on a house. Again, looking at types of housing, this is single family is the black, um, multifamily is the tan, and it kind of starts at the, the most the deepest tan is 10 plus units, um, and then black is a single family. And you can see here, Acton does have a little bit more multifamily housing product than some of your neighboring communities. Um, Boxborough has the highest percentage, but remember Boxborough is pretty small, so kind of small fluctuations affect there them a little bit more. Carlisle, almost none. So this is really the, um, where the rubber hits the road. And again, this is looking at the magic region. So not your town specifically, but this is um, talking about who's burdened with um, uh, cost. We have um, homeowner households on the left and renter households on the right. And you can see here, um, burdened is when you're paying more than 30% of your income for your housing. That's shown in yellow. The brown is if you're severely burdened. That's if you're paying more than 50% of your income. And as you look, this is organized by income. Even people making $150,000 a year are paying more than 30% for their housing costs in this region. That's not right. That's not right. 
Um, again, I talked about a, a supply issue. This is one of the basic facts. Um, in the decades from the 60s, 70s, and 80s, we were building about 30,000 household um, housing units a year as a state. Uh, we're now building about 15,000, so half of that. So we really do have a supply problem. Um, the 2010s have been better, um, so we'll see where we land when we get to 2020, um, but still significantly less than what we used to build. Um, again, we're building a lot less housing when you compare us to all other states, even though our economy is booming. So what happens? We have very tight market. We have very little vacancies. Uh, if you talk to realtors recently, they'll just say there's no inventory, there's no inventory. If you look at Middlesex County, the homeownership vacancy is less than half of a percent. A healthy market is a 2%. Rentals, also very bad. A healthy rental market is 6%. That allows for that flexibility for people to move and to find a place. It is very difficult to find housing, even if you could afford it. It still isn't there. And what happens, that means our prices go up. And again, um, with the state perspective, I'm going to compare us to some of the other states. Um, we're on the high side. We're the third highest for home values. And we're the eighth highest for rents um, compared to other states. This is a problem that we are having. When we look to the future and we say, OK, well, we know we're going to have new housing demand. Um, where is that housing demand? I mean, can't the Berkshires just take all the housing demand? That's not very realistic for, transpor uh -oh, for transportation. It's not just me, right? There's a problem. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, that'd be a problem if I was just the only one seeing that. Oh, there we go. So, um, you know, by 2030, we're going to need to build um, almost a quarter million new housing units, and, and the main demand is in the Boston region. Again, this is a very big kind of picture of the Boston region, but um, it's really eastern Massachusetts where this problem is most acute. So I'm going to come back to my question. We've got all these people. Are we meeting their housing needs? I don't think so. So what are we going to do? Um, I've talked a little bit, uh, very briefly, about a legislative fix to change the State Zoning Act that the governor has put forward in December. Um, I know there's very little time left in the legislature, but I still have my fingers crossed um, that we may see some reform that will make um, zoning for housing production easier. Um, the uh, Housing Choice Initiative program, which I run, um, works as a, um, a series of incentives and rewards. Uh, in May, we announced 69 Housing Choice communities, and I'm happy to say Acton is one of those. This is rewarding communities that are producing housing units. You've had a 5% increase in your housing units in the last five years, um, or 3% increase in some best practices. So it's, the outline of the state's a little hard to see. You can see this is kind of clustered around um, eastern Massachusetts. And in fact, it's clustered around 495. It's a pretty clear pattern. We've got the inner core, and we've got 495. I'll say the Cape and Nantucket are doing well as well. Um, and out to Worcester and Worcester County is also, there's um, some production there, including some quite small towns. But really, 495 has been one of the drivers. That didn't surprise me, because I spent seven years working in Westford. So I'm familiar with um, for the 495 area. Um, but it's kind of interesting. And then you see um, area housing, um, communities that are not producing housing uh, around 128. Governor Baker has put forward a goal of 135,000 new housing units by 2025. Um, the legislation he's filed is one way to do that. Um, providing incentives and rewards to communities that are housing choice communities is another way. Um, right now, I'm giving out um, grants to housing choice communities who are eligible for an exclusive grant program to do capital projects to help your towns do capital. Because the basic assumption is if you have more residents, you're going to need some more additional dollars to um, do some capital projects. So Governor Baker did announce the project, uh, the, the initiative in December. Um, so we've been pretty busy. <laughs> I've been out and around the state. Um, the housing choice communities, again, were announced in May. And now I'm in the grant um, giving out program. So I'll be here to um, uh, answer questions. And uh, my contact information is here. And uh, I'm going to hand it off to Judy. Working, yes. Okay. So I'm happy to be here. I'm Judy Barrett with Barrett Planning Group. Um, I'm a
planning consultant. I've worked in Massachusetts for about 30 years, uh, including in your community in the past. Um, and so I'll tell you a little bit about the project I'm working on now in your community, and then I want to share some act and specific data with you, with you that was prepared mainly by the Massachusetts Housing Partnership. Um, the project I'm working on, we were hired by the town manager, the former town manager in, in April, uh, based on a request for proposals that the town had issued uh, previously. And the project that we're working on is funded um, largely by a grant from the Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs. Um, there is also what we call an in-kind match, which is CHAPA uh, is here working with a group of people in your community on kind of housing education, housing advocacy, and then of course the Acton Community Housing Corporation has provided a cash match as well. So there are like three sources to the bigger scope of work that we are working on here. And so as a planner, you know, the first thing I always ask when I go into any community is what does your master plan say? And from our point of view, really the sort of overarching objective that we have in this project is helping the town think about how to implement Act in 2020, which is your, your master plan, um, and extremely well done one, by the way. Um, I'm joined in this project by Jen Goldson, who's not here this evening. Um, you'll see more of her in the coming months, uh, but Jen and I are doing this project um, together. So we had a specific charge, which was laid out in the town's RFP, and I just sort of want to share this with you so you sort of understand where we're coming from. Um, what the town said to us is that we want to create uh, a solid housing and economic development implementation program, which means what do we do? What things do we need to do in terms of economic development and housing, including but not limited to affordable housing? Um, and that sort of looks at kind of today's reality in terms of jobs, workforce, labor force, housing prices, housing mix, um, and streamlines the allocation of municipal resources. Acton wants to shape a unique and attractive environment for new business opportunities within the Commonwealth that is uniquely competitive but compatible with its neighbors. This program should explore previous research on the inextricable links between housing, walkable urbanism, and economic development. So that's sort of the overarching charge for our, uh, our work. So we kind of are looking at some big questions and some smaller questions. Um, the sort of big questions on the housing side are kind of under existing conditions, which you have today. Does Acton have the tools it needs to implement the housing recommendations of Acton 2020? And more recently, of course, the housing production plan, which is a plan the town created to work toward um, the 10% minimum of affordable housing under Chapter 40B. So we're kind of looking at both of those documents. Unmet housing needs exist kind of throughout Greater Boston. Chris has already addressed that. I don't need to sort of dwell on the data for that. Prior plans happen to identify yours. So what can the town do to address some of those needs? And to what extent, if anything, does housing cost uh, affect the town's ability to attract and keep a variety of resources? So those are sort of the, the housing side questions. And then there's the economic development piece. And these kind of come together in terms of looking at that relationship between housing costs, labor force development, workforce development, and jobs. And then they're kind of separate but parallel studies. So on the economic development side, we're kind of looking at what are the competitive strengths of your community in terms of attracting and keeping businesses. And what are your weaknesses? Every town has competitive strengths and some competitive weaknesses. And what are they here? And to what extent, perhaps, can you address weaknesses and build on strengths? That's kind of a fundamental question you would ask in any planning project. Another question we're looking at is how do you compare with a set of peer communities uh, in terms of your industry mix, um, the land and building inventories that you have for economic growth, pricing of the real estate, both from a rental and a, a buyer perspective, and then regulatory policies. So, you know, you're in a, comp a market competing with other communities that also want uh, economic growth, and so what, are the, what do you bring to the table in terms of your inventory, your pricing, basically the product that you offer to potential businesses? How are you organized for economic development? There's lots of different models for kind of organizing for, for business growth. How are you organized here? Is it working for you? Are there things that perhaps you could look at that you don't have now, or are you kind of a model for, for everybody else? And then does the labor force have a range of options to work locally? So that, this is sort of the scope of what we're doing between now and roughly next March is kind of the duration of, of our work here. 
So now I want to just share with you some data that the Massachusetts Housing Partnership, which is kind of a sister agency, if you will, or a sister organization uh, to CHAPA, uh, works very closely with DHCD, where Chris works. Um, I do a lot of work for MHP myself as a consultant, and they have a wonderful sort of data program um, with a couple of people who can just turn out some really interesting things about communities that they may or may not know. So one of the things that sort of, these are sort of points that I'm going to talk about as I talk about the data from MHP. I'm going to start defaulting to acronyms and I can't help it. Acton's population has seen significant growth over the last 18 years. I don't think that's any surprise to any of you who live here. This is a beautiful town. It's a nice town and people want to live here. Your population is aging. Um, most housing is single family units, as Chris sort of showed on that previous slide. You have you know, quite a few single family homes relative to other types of stock. Housing costs here are prohibitive for many people. Certainly there are people who can't afford to live here because they're here. We also have people who live here who can't really afford to live here. So to what extent are, do housing costs sort of affect uh, your resident population? And then kind of key areas of concern in housing for your community are how do you attract young families um, to keep the community kind of vibrant and vital and then helping seniors age in their community. These are sort of these, you know, ends of the age spectrum that Chris talked about a little bit uh, before. So here's sort of a little picture of what population growth has been like in your community since 1930. Uh, as you can see, there was this peak that happened, uh, roughly coincident with the construction of 495. Uh, it also happens to be um, when, when many of the boomers, which includes me, by the way, uh, you know, were born and entering school. So you had a lot of population growth happen here, and clearly a lot of housing growth as well. 60, 70, 80, 90, there was a plateau as there was everywhere. And of course, your population has continued to grow. I don't think that's any big surprise. It is a nice town, people want to be here. So what age groups are dominant and has this always been the case? And this slide coupled with the next three, I think just tell a really interesting story about your community. Um, in 2016, we have data from the Federal Census Bureau um, that's based on surveys they conduct kind of every year and report in five-year intervals. And so as of that data set, which is the most recent that we have, um, you can kind of see Acton's in the blue, and if you can make it out there, the state um, in sort of a dotted line. Okay, so you can kind of see where you are relative to sort of the statewide norms. And what you have, no surprise, um, are a lot of people in that sort of working age, peak working age, peak income age group, 35, 45, 55. And then, of course, quite a few school-age children, mainly in that sort of middle school, high school range. So that's sort of a snapshot as of 2016. And then quite a, not quite as many seniors um, as the state as a whole, um, and not quite as many um, 20 to 24-year-olds. That's sort of a millennial group, for lack of a, I don't like that term, but that's what we'll call them. So in 1990, um, this is kind of what you looked like. Again, Acton's in blue and the state as a whole is in dotted line. Um, you, again, had a real concentration of people in that working age, 35, 45, 55 group. And you also had a lot of school age kids. So that's where you were in 1990. And the senior population here in 1990 was quite a bit less in terms of a percentage of the whole than the state. In 2000, 10 years later, you still had a significant bubble of people in that sort of peak working years, peak income years group, 35, 45, 55. And they, you're starting to see this sort of shift in the school age population. You are, again, your sort of 20-somethings were significantly less than the state as a whole, but your school age population as a percentage of the whole was bigger, but shifting compared with the previous decade as it was for the state. Excuse me. So by 2010, this again is this sort of picture. You've got um, that sort of middle school peak, which relates to the sort of high school age peak that was in the first slide, because that's 2016. You can kind of see that this pattern here of two age groups that sort of tend to be kind of dominant in this community. One is that group of sort of the peak wage earning population, peak working age group, peak child-rearing age group, and then young children. And in between those, 
you tend to have fewer people as a percentage of the population as a whole. Owners tend to dominate the housing inventory here. When you have a community that's comprised mainly of single family homes, that's not at all a surprise. About 23% of the households living in your community currently rent. That is not necessarily an indicator of the size of your rental inventory. It's people who live in housing that was developed for rental purposes. It's also people living in housing that might have actually been built for homeowner purposes, but someone is hanging on to a single family home and chooses to rent it. So 23% of the people living in households living in your community currently rent, and 77% um, are homeowners. Um, and you can kind of see, again, the sort of relationship between that and the makeup of your housing stock, which is predominantly single family. And again, relative to the state, which is the broken line, you're yellow, you're yellow on this chart on, the, on my left, you're right. That broken line is the state. You know, you have a, a larger percentage of your homes being single family than the state as a whole, and somewhat less multifamily. Although, as Chris said, and I can just tell you because I've worked in almost every community around here, you do tend to have in your town somewhat more multifamily stock than some of the communities around you. So it certainly isn't the case that Acton hasn't done anything about housing. Um, but this is kind of what your housing stock looks like. So the question then you know, begs for us as planners, um, are other towns in the same situation? And the answer is absolutely. This is not unique to Acton. You may have some distortions in the age mix in your community, but it's, there's a state pattern here, and you're just kind of a little off of it in terms of school-age children and working-age population and lower seniors and lower sort of 20-somethings. But there's a pattern overall here, and it's a struggle for every community to try to figure out what to do about housing supply, housing inventory, and housing pricing. So. The, the not dotted line on here, but, the, but not yellow, is sort of 99 towns that are sort of similar to Acton in terms of the market makeup of the types of households who live there. As you can kind of see, you know, you're not all that far off from the sort of peer group, if you will, but somewhat. You have, you know, an, an age mix that's a little more dramatic in terms of two, two areas of extremes. So there's another thing we tend to look at in housing policy, and it's this concept called the housing wage, which is really an indicator of what does a household have to earn in order to afford prevailing market rents. Recent data released by the National Low Income Housing Co um, Coalition uh, show that Massachusetts has the sixth highest housing wage in the nation, which simply means for prevailing market rents, this is what you have to be able to make to afford a typical unit, typically a two-bedroom unit. So if you're assuming that someone works 40 hours a week, 52 weeks of the year, um, that level of income translates into a housing wage of, in Massachusetts, $28.64. So if you work at minimum wage, that's a struggle, because that's not what you make. And in fact, in order to be able to afford a decent unit at a lower wage, you need to be working, at, in essence, 84 hours a week. So that's that concept of a housing wage. It's if you're not actually earning that much, what is the work expectation that you would have to do to be able to compensate for the fact that your wage is lower? To afford a two-bedroom apartment here, the housing wage would be $30 an hour. The young Acton home buyer, this is a particularly interesting slide, I think, um, in part because I have children who fall in this age mix. Um, in 1980, the median income for young people was $50,979. Um, in 2013, the year for which we have the most recent age-based median data, it's only 55,279. So the actual income growth in that younger population hasn't been all that great. And yet, the cost of a median single-family home has changed significantly. Um, in 1987, it was $350,000, I'll round numbers here. Um, by 2018, it was 520,000. 43% of our students, um, you know, yesterday had student debt, now it's 60%. The average student debt yesterday was about $14,000, today it's almost 30. So things, the sort of tensions that younger people are dealing with to be able to afford housing, 
have really changed, and yet income growth really has not kept pace with it. So that's part of the challenge of trying to house younger workers who keep our economy uh, vibrant. So what do these things mean for your community? Well, I think that the program that, that Dana's working on here with the Acton Community Housing Corporation and other groups, is sort of these are kind of conclusions that people are looking at. As the population grows, housing needs change. Currently, longtime residents do not find suitable options within the community, which simply has to do with the range of housing types that are available. Moderate cost housing is not available here, therefore younger people can't or don't want to move in. By not addressing the issue of housing affordability, long-term residents and seniors become the primary tax base, and this is not sustainable. I will tell you, I've been saying for 30 years to local officials and town managers, we need to keep an eye on what's happening with the older population. Because when everybody was working, there was a certain degree of financial flexibility in our communities. And it made people more able to support things like Proposition 2 and a half overrides, capital debt exclusions, and all those things that are important to running a community. When your population begins to have less financial flexibility, it becomes harder for people to afford those things. And tension builds into towns. So this sort of aging of the population is not a small matter, and it's not just about housing. It's about the way our communities run and how we take care of ourselves as communities. The town needs to pursue housing strategies that provide the kind of housing that both young people and downsizing adults want. Higher density in town centers, walkable locations, you know, near transit and others. So these are the kinds of things that are being worked on here and what we've been asked to do is to sort of like help the town identify ways to address those objectives. I think with that, it's Kelly's turn. You're lucky my presentation is short. Um, so one uh, statistic that's not in there that I just wanted to mention because we were talking about the aging of Acton. Um, in 2000, 11.6% of Acton residents were over 60. And in 2016, 17.8% were over 60. So that population's grown by 51% as a percentage of the um, community. And we're seeing that uh, on our waiting list. So when I first started working for the Acton Housing Authority, we used to be able to tell people it was six months to a year for senior housing. That was 13 years ago. Now we tell people the person at the top of the list who's a local resident applied five years ago. Um, so it's a five-year wait. And our units aren't turning over. We haven't had a unit turnover in over seven months. So everybody who's coming to us asking for housing um, we haven't been able to help a single one of them. Uh, we have one unit that's going to become available um, in September that we know of, but other than that, we haven't had one turnover. So the Acton Housing Authority, a lot of people don't know where we are. Um, we have 68 units on Windsor Ave of senior disabled housing. 13.5% of all our senior units are set aside for people under 60 with disabilities. Um, on Sachem Way, we have a 23-unit um, senior development. Uh, senior, um, development. We also have 12 units of family housing that are part of the state public housing program. And we have 25 condos that are scattered throughout the community and a 12-unit group home for people with um, mental health issues. We also own units that the town has helped us create. Um, we have a 12-unit um, development that's a mixed finance development at Sachem Way as well, which the town provided community preservation funds, um, which leveraged, we received 700,000 in CPA money and leveraged 3.3 million from the state um, and private um, donors. Um, we also have eight uh, units that are condos that are part of the local initiative program that the town provided resources for, either with CPA money deve or development funds. We also um, manage 155 vouchers, um, federal vouchers, and 20 alternate housing vouchers, which Senator Eldridge mentioned, are for people um, with disabilities under 60. Um, those vouchers, uh, of the 155, about 90 of them are located in Acton, but everyone who comes to the top of the list is either an Acton Boxborough resident or employee. Um, the voucher pays rent in the private market. The tenant pays 30% of their rent. So I, I talked a little bit about how we haven't had turnover in the, in the last um, 
few years, the people that we have housed um, that were seniors, 50% um, were veterans. They had a veteran preference. 25% needed housing and came to the top of the list because they could no longer use the housing they were living in in Acton. They had a disability which made their housing not um, accessible to them. Um, and all of the federal vouchers went to people who lived or worked in Acton, and 66% of our family units went to Acton residents. So this is the current waiting list. Um, the, the one on the left is all applicants on the list, and the one on the middle is local applicants, so people who either live or work in Acton. And on the right is when that local applicant who's at the top of the list applied. Um, so the senior at the top of the list applied March 22nd, 2013. So some seniors do, people can go jump over the list if they're in emergency. So sometimes people have medical emergencies and they won't have to wait as long as everybody else. They'll go to the top of the list. Veterans get a preference, they'll go to the top of the list. But if you're a standard applicant, that's when you, the top of the list applied. And we have, um, right now that 69 number isn't correct. We have 78 seniors right now on the wait. Okay, so I, I talked about this, that the average wait for senior housing is five years. The last two years, we only assisted eight new senior households with over 120 households on the waiting list. More than 50% of the senior units are on the second or third floor and not accessible, so not the great, greatest um, type of housing for people who are aging. Um, and uh, the waiting list currently, it will take tw over 30 years to serve everybody on the list. Um, this, I, I already mentioned that the towns provided funds. The income limits have been updated since um, this uh, mark, uh, was done, so let me just give you the right uh, number. So for one person, the income limit is 56,800, two persons, 64,900, three person household, 73,000, four person household, 78, um, I'm sorry, 81,100, and five person is now 87,600. And those are the fair market rents. That's it. Now it's Nancy's turn. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> Uh, okay, last but not least, hopefully, now I'm going to talk to you about what we're doing, what we can do, and future activities. First of all, who we are. The Acton Community Housing Corporation has this funky title. It's because we started as a private nonprofit in the 80s. Uh, our founder was the late Betty McManus, and she uh, brought this organization forward for decades, and in 1996, through a home rule petition, we became uh, a town board. We're actually part of the town organization with special powers that the home rule petition granted us, uh, but we're appointed by the selectmen. Our major spending has to be approved by the selectmen, and our charge is to facilitate affordable housing. And in order to do that, we guide developers through a process that we have and then make recommendations to town boards. And these are the members of our committee. The affordable housing goals are pretty much the same as they are across the state. Every community is expected to have 10% of all of its housing units as affordable. And uh, to help that along, the legislature in 1969 passed the law, Chapter 40B, that uh, allowed communities to build multifamily housing and other denser uh, housing uh, without the obstacles that are usually put in the way with zoning and so forth. In Acton, right now, based on the 2010 census, which is what the counts are always uh, compared to, we have 8,500 units, so we need 850 units in order to reach 10%. At the moment, we're at 574, which gives us 6.7%. In 2015, we did a new housing production plan, and uh, we had public participation. Uh, we have it's a fairly lengthy 
uh, plan, and tonight you can see that we're working on goal two. We've been working on some of the other goals, but we very definitely uh, are interested in educating the community, and I think there's been a tremendous amount of awareness uh, information put forward tonight. So what is a comprehensive permit, also known as a 40B? 40B is the law. The comprehensive permit is the methodology for building affordable housing. What it does is streamlines the development of affordable housing by overruling local zoning. For instance, Carlisle, I think, has two acre zoning or four acre zoning. Uh, you can't build multifamily on, on a, a lot like that. Uh, there are other things that communities have done either intentionally or they've always been that way uh, that discourage uh, lower cost housing to meet the needs that we're seeing here tonight. Uh, so it streamlines that and it allows greater density, but it still has to meet Wetlands Protection Act. It has to meet uh, local building codes, Title V, but it can be granted variances from other local bylaws. In affordable housing, there's capital A affordable housing and there's little a affordable housing. We're talking about big A affordable housing. That means it's officially affordable housing and countable. It has a long-term deed restriction on it that it keeps it affordable in perpetuity. Uh, it uh, requires an affordable rent or the affordable price for low or moderate income eligible households. Uh, the unit must be counted toward the 10% and there must be an affirmative fair marketing of the units uh, with generally with a lottery. And so who is income eligible? See how this matches up with some of the uh, income uh, statistics we've just seen. Generally, they're working families. They're always working families of some sort because, as you see in the end, they have to qualify for a 30-year mortgage. Uh, but generally, the uh, families we serve are 45, make 45 to 78,000 a year. Uh, working uh, workforce housing, uh, people also like to call it. Their household assets have to be below 75,000. They have to be a first-time home buyer with some exceptions. And the housing costs cannot exceed 38% of their gross monthly income. And they have to qualify for a fixed 30-year uh, mortgage. And locally, uh, we're pretty lucky in getting local preference for most of our developments when we request it. And that can be given, 70% of the units in a given development can be for local preference which uh, that's the definition of employees, people who are privately employed or publicly, or people who live here. The approval process is something that's laid out in the law. We have our own process that we use, uh, development guidelines that uh, someone will come into town hall with a piece of land. These are all private developments. It's not, we are not developers, we're facilitators. So they will bring in something to town hall, they'll be referred to ACHC, they'll bring a preliminary plan to us, they'll consult with us, we'll send them to department heads, uh, other town boards if necessary. We may do a public information session, uh, and then there'll be a presentation to the selectmen and ACHC again for a support letter and then they ultimately get a state agency approval and then can go to the Zoning Board of Appeals, who are the super board, who are the ones who issue the comprehensive permit. So now, what are we doing at the moment? We I'm gonna show you four proposals that are in front of us right now. We'll call them small, medium, large, and extra large. And the small one is currently in front of the ZBA it's called Residence at Kelly's Corner. This is 31 one-bedroom units for seniors, 62 and older, and eligible disabled adults. Uh, it has a fully, it will be fully accessible with elevators. It has easy access to Kelly's Corner. Uh, and all, un all units in a rental count toward the 10%. This is a low-income housing tax credit project that probably will not get funding 
for at least two years, but right now this is the rendering of it. The next one, uh, you may be familiar with the large um, 380-unit uh, Avalon rental project out in Magog Park. Uh, 296 of the units are in Acton, and they're proposing to expand the uh, current development with an upscale rental of two and three bedroom units, uh, many with garages, all with exterior front doors, even though they're rentals. And they're hoping, while it's not age restricted, they're to uh, attract downsizing seniors and will have high-end finishes and amenities and high-end rents. This is one of the uh, designs, there are about seven building designs. Another one has been brought to us at Piper Lane and School Street. We haven't heard any more since the initial presentation, but it's proposed to be 40 attached townhouses for, for sale. So 25% of them, or 10, would be affordable. Two and three bedrooms, uh, walkable to commuter rail, South Acton Center. And that's a rendering of the townhouse building. Uh, and the extra large is apartments at Powder Mill. This is one we've been working on for a couple of years. It's on the Maynard Acton line. The proposal is 254 rental units total, uh, which would be 173 in Acton and 81 in Maynard with a lot of amenities. This will be a friendly 40B. Both towns will hear this uh, proposal at the same time. And uh, one, Maynard will take the sewage from Acton's part of the development, and Acton will provide the water to the Maynard side. So we have those four, and that's one of the building renderings. So what else can we do? What else are we in the process of doing and talking about things that are in our housing production plan? Uh, we're talking about expanding the accessory unit program. We're talking about dividing large homes in the historic district into small apartments. That section is in the housing production plan, was actually written by one of the historic district commissioners. Uh, we're very much in support of the housing authority's efforts to get housing on town-owned land at River Street or Main Street, and we're also anxious to encourage accessible units, market and affordable, whenever. And that's it. So thank you. Uh, maybe a round of applause for all of our presenters. Um, I think that, oops, I'll use this. This will be easier. Um, Thank you both for all of the information and keeping your remarks on time, because I think that will leave us plenty of time for questions and answers, which is the portion of the night where we are now. Um, so we're going to open it up to questions from the audience, just a couple of parameters to help us make sure that everyone has a chance to speak. So. Um, Please, and also to get you out of here on time, which is something I'm always very mindful of. Um, so please be mindful of how long you are speaking, and if you've spoken once, please allow others to speak before getting up for a second time. I know there's a lot to cover here, um, but we want to make sure that everyone has a chance to um, contribute. Also remember, I, I mentioned this at the beginning, but I'll mention it again, it bears repeating that this is the beginning of a conversation. There's no decisions being made here. It's just a, um, a time to be respectful of others and differing opinions and share your thoughts, your questions, your strategies uh, with the group. Um, one thing that I should note in the back of the room on the table, Alec can raise your hand. Um, if you don't feel comfortable getting up and speaking and you have a question or a comment or maybe we just don't get around to you and there's not enough time, there are note cards at the back. Um, you can write your question, your comment, and someone from this group. If you, have a, if you want someone to be in touch with you, you could put your contact information on it. Um, someone can be in touch with you. If it's just a general question or comment for, for folks here to think about, um, we, we, they can be shared. Um, so I will open it up. If you have a question, you can go, I think that mic I'll turn on, actually. Um, and oh, thank you, Kristen. Um, so if you have a question, comment, 
anything else you want to add, uh, the panelists are here to, to listen. My name is Frank Austin. Uh, I've certainly benefited quite a bit by what I've heard this evening. <clears throat> Uh, I volunteer in, in the area of uh, homeless families, and we, we have a problem in the state, which I think Acton, uh, to its credit, has responded to some extent. We've made available some units at Sacom Way for families coming out of shelter. These are circumstantially stuck people uh, who are not necessarily just low income. They've lost jobs, husbands, medical problems, what have you. Uh, and there's a lot of them. So, uh, bravo to act in forsaken way. Much of what I've heard tonight has been around the economic parameters of workforce and all, which are all, and seniors, and as, uh, <laughs> uh, these are all very valid uh, concerns. But I guess the question I would come to you is, is what, what do we envision uh, as a town going forward F to open up truly low-income affordable properties. These folks are either at the very low end of the wage scale and cannot make market values or are in a homeless situation. Thanks. So the majority of our residents are um, below 30% of median income. Um, so most of the seniors in our housing are below 30 percent. They're on fixed income. Their income is Social Security. Some people have some annuities and um, pensions, but most people nowadays aren't that fortunate. Um, the, on the family side, we are the workforce housing. So over 70 percent of our families are working, and most of them are working locally. They're working at the supermarkets, the coffee shops, the nursing homes. Um, the restaurants, uh, their relatives of people who work for the town. Um, we have several families in our housing who are related to town officials um, who grew up in Acton. We have a lot of families who grew up in Acton. And most of our families are here for a short period of time. They, when they are, have young children, and they, most of our families are single heads of household, so they're living in our housing while the mother's working. Um, and then as their children age and get jobs, go to college, they move out. Um, we have a lot of families who've actually participated in our family self-sufficiency program and the escrow program on the state side who've become first-time home buyers um, working with the ACHC. So, so we do have affordable housing for people at, you know, at 50% and under. The majority of our folks are under 30% and they come from Act. Tara Fredericks, West Acton. Thank you very much, and I'm so happy that uh, people are talking about homeless and transition um, housing because we have actually no, um, not, I mean, maybe we do now, but uh, it's not my understanding that we have any transitional housing. Um, I help people that live in their cars and help them find places to go. And if you call the police station, they say, well, we don't have that facility here, that infrastructure. Um, I think it's a crime that we don't have that, um, and I hope that in the future we can buy down a couple condos and have bunk beds in them and have a women's one and a men's one, but I think that it's important to do because um, we talked about the eviction of people dealing, leaving with their cars. These people aren't served by the building production plans that we're talking about. Um, in fact, uh, if you go to the Housing Choice Bill, the 4290 that I think you're sent here to talk to us about, um, you, you can search the word affordable and it's not even there. The earlier version had uh, you know, some 25% or whatever, like a 40B type situation, but it's, the language has been taken out in this recent version. So please, if you're part of that conversation, uh, make, it, make sure that the zoning relief comes along with a requirement to actually serve the people who need the help the most. And in fact, the housing chart slide, which had all the levels of housing and the number of people in each category, I found it really interesting that the 150 plus was everybody above then, but then the poor people were all broken down into little bits, so it looked like there weren't that many. But if you add everybody that's below the amount that you can actually qualify with one of these new units, it's the largest section of people who are the most vulnerable. And so I object to showing that there's a need, the infographic that's being handed out, 
that there's this dramatic need, but then not serving them. And talking about first time starter homes and stuff like that, when the need is actually um, at the much lower income scale. Two thirds of the building permits that are let in Massachusetts are for people coming in from out of state. So I respect the uh, Boston you know, permits per person, I agree. There's 300 acres in Boston alone that are owned by the town, the city, that are not um, being used for um, but development of badly needed houses. But if you look statewide, Acton has done its share. So you look at uh, the number of permits by town and the average, we're almost twice the average. So just keep that in mind. Um, yes, I'm almost done, okay. Yes, uh, uh, all right. Um, the income growth, if you look at, uh, no, the income growth of the lowest brackets have been going down, relatively speaking, in terms of cost of housing to um, the cost of living. But yet the income brackets for the programs that, that are being promoted by these you know, developer relief programs is going up 10% a year. If you look at the, what it qual you had to qualify for um, a few years ago and what you can qualify now. So I think that that's also an issue. Um, the evictees, people who are being evicted don't qualify for these programs. You have to be make enough money to pay for a mortgage to qualify for these programs. And at the same time, we have 3,000, a third of our stock, because they said only, they looked at the, the, the way that the numbers were a little bit, I think, distorted. It forgot to mention that all these condos, very affordable condos, 150,000 or less, about 40 of these are sold in, in, in Acton every year that are under 200,000 a year. Um, there are 33 or something like that that are below 150,000. These can be bought and deed restricted. So while we sit and wait for all this other stuff to happen, people, basically poor people are being held hostage for these building plans when we could be doing this with a transfer tax and, and other things. Uh, in fact, we did a survey not too long ago and people, the large majority of people, 70% in the survey said they would pay $200 a year to fund a $1.6 million a year to buy down these condos. So we need this help to get this started and we're kind of being, you know, uh, slow rolled by folks that are promoting building as the solution. So, thank you. Thank you. You ready? Okay. Hi, Deborah Sines. Um, I want to say quickly that I support a variety of housing for folks that you know, various levels and with a focus on people who with the greatest need. I'm not opposed to doing that at all. Um, I was delighted to see that one of the goals of this was to enact the 2020 master plan. So as you go forward, I want to just um, remind you of some of the other things that are in the master plan because we can't just sort of build infinitely, and I don't mean we need to build infinitely, but there are real limits. You know, there was a book called Limits to Growth, and there are reasons for that. And so I'm just going to call out a couple of the objectives that are in the master plan. Oops, but I need my visual aid. One is protect the quality and quantity of Acton's water. We are challenged because all of our potable water is from shallow aquifers, and a couple of our most productive wells are potentially threatened by Superfund site issues. Um, Give me a sec while I scroll. Another goal is, oops, wrong one, sorry. Another goal is to reduce em emissions of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. And I bring this up both because there are a lot of embedded emissions in building and new construction. Refurbishing older construction is a lot less intensive. And the other thing is that until we have a, an actually functional mass transit system, more bodies tends to mean more cars. So I offer that. And the last objective I want to point out is healthy patterns of land use. And some of the items under that are concentrate growth, um, protect open space. We need to protect the open space. I mean, I, I'm happy to do infill and to do redevelopment and that kind of thing. I would like us not to just be sort of planting giant <laughs> things on existing open space if we can help it. Thank you. Hi, my name is Gail Palm. Um, I am a senior, but that's not um, who I am going to talk about right now. Um, I have a daughter who's 33 years old, <clears throat> who has an intellectual disability and has been working in Acton um, for 11 years. 
and um, she still lives with my husband and me, and the goal is for her uh, to get out. <laughs> um, and that goal is shared by her, who wants to be more independent, but she will never be able to live completely on her own. My concern is about people with uh, intellectual developmental disabilities who, who are not just um, disabled by you know, physical disabilities, but those who cannot live on their own and will need a support person. I looked with interest at your uh, proposal for that Kmart area with the one bedroom uh, units that are going in. And the idea that came to mind for me was what about those who um, could be in a unit, but also would need support. And I think about taking some of those units and um, utilizing them for people like my daughter, who can be somewhat independent, but need to have a support person in the area for um, you know, some of those you know, cooking needs or middle of the night problems that sometimes we all think we're gonna be able to serve well on our own, but something happens in the middle of the night and they need somebody. So my hope is that if you could keep that in mind, uh, for people who are not appropriate for group homes, um, which is not something that I'm against, it's just not appropriate for my daughter or some other people, and um, who cannot afford to live in, um, you know, in a place like, you know, like Avalon or um, some of the other places, there's one in Concord, Concord Muse, um, and I would like you to just keep that in mind for those of us who worry about our children every day, 24 hours a day knowing that we're not always going to be there for them, and they deserve a chance to be out on their own. But thank you. I'd just like to say um, she should get on our waiting list. Um, so, yeah, Section 8, um, and for our um, senior under 60. Um, so if anyone who needs a live-in aid can apply for a two-bedroom. Yeah. Uh-huh. And that was because of it being through the uh oh, right here. Okay. Okay. Um, and it's hard to get people for shared living, especially in this area, because of the fact that thank you. I usually have a big mouth and people can hear me. Um, it's hard to get people for shared living, which does pay more than what was the thing that we that I used to have? Sarah and Michael. Now I forgot it too. Wh which one? Yeah, adult family care. Adult, adult family care pays very poorly. Um, but even if you're able to get shared living through DDS, um, get the funding, it's difficult to get people out this way. I think it's because of the socioeconomic um, population. People don't necessarily want to do those jobs. And the other piece that can be a deterrent is the lack of, um, you know, public transportation for people that want to come out here and, you know, have a life where they can then not have to have necessarily have a car. If you live in Brookline, Brighton, it's easier. But I am dedicated, and my where whole family is dedicated to staying in this area. This is where my daughter's life is. This is where her friends are. She's got great work at Not Your Average Joe's and used to work at Trader Joe's. And, and she gets her services through Minuteman, and those are her people. So thank you very much. My name is Bernice Baran. Your statistics are very persuasive in terms of the need statewide and uh, more particularly in Acton for the need for more affordable housing. The question that I want to raise is about the nature of what you're doing with this grant. My understanding is that the grant is to relate the need for more affordable housing to the economic enrichment of Acton. And a couple of you touched on that at the beginning of your presentation. I must say that since I moved to Acton about 15 years ago, I have seen an increasing number of empty storefronts, which is very distressing to me. I'm certainly aware that not only are the malls crumbling, but certainly local stores in every community 
are having issues. But I'd like you to explain a little bit more on how we do our studying will be related in the final analysis to the economic development of the town. I just wanted to mention um, the reason we want everyone to speak into the mic is this is being recorded and we want to be able to hear people's comments. So thank you. So I'll try to address your question. The study connects housing and economic development at one point, and it is an, an, effort, an effort to look at the degree to which, if at all, housing costs in Acton affect the town's ability to, to pursue the economic development goals of its master plan. That question is in there. Beyond that, there are, two, there are almost two separate studies that are working in parallel. There's the, you have recommendations in your housing, your, your master plan and your housing production plan around housing, and what things can the town do to attempt to implement those recommendations. But then the economic development study is really looking at a whole lot of other things besides housing. It's looking at, you know, what are the targeting, what should the targeted industries approach be here if there is going to be one? Um, what is the market from an economic development perspective for, uh, for business development of different sizes? What inventory do you have to offer to businesses that are in a growth mode? There's a lot of questions like this that affect the way you plan for economic development that have nothing to do with housing. And so if you were just trying to do a study that said, housing is the economic development barrier here, you probably would miss a lot. So we're really, it's two studies that join together at a particular question, but then beyond that, they're very, they're, they're separate. Uh, good evening, thanks so much for having this uh, forum. Uh, Danny Factor, uh, 11 Davis Road. Uh, I'm a um, member of the Acton Commission on Disabilities uh, and also a member of the Board of Directors of Green Acton, but I'm speaking tonight uh, solely as a, a private citizen. Uh, I, I'm wondering after hearing, uh, you know, in particular, uh, Jamie's uh, poignant story, and I'm so happy that Jamie's here as a public official. Uh, we have, in, in myself and Tammy here, a couple of uh, candidates for public office, maybe more uh, in the audience as well. Um, and I'm just so glad by, um, you know, how many people attended this forum. Um, but when I hear uh, Jamie's story about uh, the uh, uh, family uh, that was in transition, Tara's story as well, uh, you know, I, I recall myself, my own personal uh, experience was that, you know, I got a call one day from, uh, sounded like an older man on the phone. He actually said he was calling people out of the white pages and the yellow pages. I, I didn't even know that they still existed. Um, and um, he asked, um, uh, he was looking around for people to do painting jobs. Uh, and I actually told him that I, did have you know, a small condo, but I did have some painting that could be done, and I hired him. And he was a, a pleasant uh, 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 senior, um, and did a very good job. And then about two years later, uh, he literally showed up on my doorstep, and something was, was clearly wrong. You could tell just by the smell that he hadn't you know, had a shower uh, in a long time. And uh, as I... Uh, let him into my unit. It was clear that he had become homeless. Uh, he was living in Concord, um, but he had had a, a crisis and no longer had a place to live. And this was a gentleman who met all the highest criteria for public housing. He was a senior, he had a disability, uh, and he was a veteran. And he went to, in his case, the Concord Housing Authority, and he was told that although they put him in uh, emergency application and first on the list, they told him it would be a year until they had something for him. And when he said, what do I do until then, they, they just said, I'm, I'm sorry, we can give you a voucher for a, this uh, a hotel for, for one night and uh, in a monastery for two nights, but they didn't have anything for, for 365 days or anything like that. Um, myself and, and my uh, partner housed him uh, for six weeks in, uh, in our apartment. And I'm a public interest attorney myself, and I, I can tell you that it took an army of volunteers to be able to uh, find him something, uh, mostly and only with help of extended family and literally um, you know, doing the hard work to uh, mend relations with other family members. I mean, it took, it took an army 
just to be able to serve this one person. So I just you know, want everybody to know that there are many, many of these stories and you know, perhaps, you know, perhaps we need to collect all the narratives and put it together to show people that this is really happening. I've heard stories of, we talk about millennials, of young people who have been kicked out of their apartments um, and houses by their parents in this area because they are uh, gay uh, or lesbian and have been living on people's couches. There are all kinds of groups of people who um, uh, are in need. And I, I'm hearing more and more of a call for transitional housing, uh, a place where, you know, a completely separate issue from the great work that the Acton Housing Authority uh, is doing. Uh, I think uh, just a couple of uh, suggestions that would help. I think that if, if Acton Town Meeting, um, there would be a warrant to actually declare that housing is a human right. It's not just something that is a convenience, it's an actual human right. Um, we'd have uh, a leg to stand on. Um, I think that Acton could consider, instead of just having uh, a town social worker that works very hard at serving these people, uh, if we can have an economic development committee, we can have an act in human services committee to support them and look out for our most vulnerable people. And this could complement the work that the Act in Housing Authority uh, is, uh, is doing. I think the ideas as far as buying up uh, these uh, condominiums uh, is a growing idea and it solves two problems at the same time. It solves uh, the issue of uh, public necessity needs and also what Deborah Symes brought up about our need to have environmental sustainability uh, because if we don't halt climate change, there are going to be uh, refugees uh, coming to Acton, uh, you know, as well. So, you know, we have to think about this uh, making ties between people who are concerned about public necessity needs for people and also people uh, who understand uh, the environmental crisis that we live in as well. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Tammy Govet. Thank you. I'm Tammy Gouveia, I live in the village of Nagog Woods, and your statistics and the stories that we've heard definitely highlight the housing crisis that we're facing. So glad to see so many people here. One of the things that I would like for us to consider is that when we're looking at housing that's intended for people who are downsizing, to not build multi um, floored units. And that's what I saw in the rendition. I've seen over and over and over again you know, elders um, who are living in units that are really not made for them to be able to age in place. And Acton is a community that is an, an age-friendly community, and the state is as well. So I think we need to be a little bit creative about mixed ages, mixed family types, so that we can ensure that our seniors are able to stay in place. And that, you know, and it also supports those with disabilities as well to make sure that we have single floor housing options available. Thank you. I just note one of the um, suggestions in your housing production plan was accessory apartments, or they're also called accessory dwelling units. That's a way for seniors to stay in place, whether you convert your garage into a unit or something like that. It does not necessarily have to be somebody that's related to you. So maybe as you go on with this conversation, you'll continue to look at those accessory dwelling units as a very, um, it is really infill um, and a very gentle way to add some density. Um, hi, Franny Osmond. It's just yesterday I met. Um, a woman who was moving to this area with her baby and her husband who's hoping to get a job, two chemical engineers, and she still felt she couldn't find good, affordable housing. They rented in Nashua while they're starting their jobs in, at Devon's. Um, I would, I still have a question. Um, how much do the banks participate, local banks, in some efforts. Um, I was just telling Nancy about my thought about turning McMansions into multiple units and she and Kelly were reminding me that in order to do that with the current zoning it would have to be four units, um, which I don't see anything wrong with it because it would have to be a 40B. Um, so my sort of question is, is there something we could do easily 
or is it just major zoning changes to encourage people to break up large houses into small units? And is there any effort from the banks to help fund it? Because a lot of people might want to put an accessory unit in their house, or three if I had my way, um, but they it's hard to afford to do the construction. So I'm wondering if there are any ways we can do incentives, tax incentives, or having banks help somehow to make it easier for people. Quickly, because I know we're going to run out of time. Uh, I've actually worked in several communities that have zoning precisely for this purpose to enable older homes to be divided into smaller units. Um, and I can also tell you we have a few towns in Massachusetts that do provide local tax incentives to support that kind of initiative. Amherst has special legislation that allows them to uh, enter into, into sort of basically tax increment financing agreements for, to support development. Provincetown has um, special legislation that allows them to waive the property taxes for property owners who went to lower moderate income tenants. So there are sort of interesting taxation tools out there. Most of them require special legislation because despite the fact that we're a home rule state, we're not really. Um, but I mean, those things do exist. But generally, yes, once you talk about taking a unit in a single family district and dividing it into multiple units, you have to have some type of zoning in place to support that. But it's doable, it's done, there are tools for that purpose. Generally, it's called housing conversion. It's yeah. called a conversion. It's yeah. kind of, if you're looking for zoning, you might want, you could yeah. look at that. A few communities where there's an active office in local government, a community development or department or something that's working closely with banks and basically using the community, you know, a, a reinvestment act as kind of a, a, a leverage, if you will, to get the banks to participate in things like pools for that purpose. Um, I don't think there's any sort of programmatic level. I think it really is a question of working with the individual banks in your community. Hi, uh, Lauren Morton, uh, Marshall Path at North Acton. Um, you know, one of, um, I'm really glad to hear people talking about the need for transitional housing and for those kinds of things, because I think one of the things that we need to start as a state is being more creative. For example, you know, what you were talking about, the accessory housing or converting housing. And I think it's also important to look at you know, maybe smaller units in a multi-family kind of situation um, with more common spaces, mm -hmm. because that would make the rents lower and be able to provide, you know, for young people and then for older people. For example, in Brookline, one of the senior housing options has very small apartments, but people love living there because it's near all the amenities. That's right. They just, it's on Center Street yep. in Brookline, and yep. they can get everywhere, um, every kind of store that they need in short walking distance, even in the winter, it's well plowed and that kind of thing. So that's kind of what I think environmentally makes sense as well, because if you put units near the services, then you can have people walking to those services using public transportation. We are growing our public transportation, so it's finally becoming a place you might be able to live in without a car. I, I'd have to ask people that don't have cars how they're doing with it, but um, I think we've come a long way that way. But really, I think we need to expand our horizons and really think creatively about the needs that are out there and how we can best accomplish them and how we can use good design to make them look a way that is more palatable to people and then they'll not be so objection, ob object Objectionable. Jep Objectionable. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, objectionable to uh, affordable housing okay. coming near nearer to their own community or neighborhood. Thank you. Well, thank you again uh, to... I have to turn my mic on. So thank you again to everyone for coming tonight. We're close to on time getting out of here. But um, I especially want to thank all of our presenters. So one more time, thank you. <laughs> Thank you to uh, Senator Eldridge for joining us. 
Um, I did want to just say that, you know, I mentioned before that I'm working with folks here in Acton on building support and uh, helping engage the community and provide public education around affordable housing. So if there's anyone here who'd like to get involved in that effort, um, please find me after. I'd be happy to talk with you and uh, connect. Um, and I believe this presentation will be available on, on the website on the ACHC website and the um, whole presentation was um, taped and will be showing on the Acton TV uh, channel. So, um, and then I th think lastly, if you can advance, there's a contact information. If you have any questions, um, you can get in touch with Nancy. There's her contact information, her email. Uh, so thank you very much and have a good night. <laughs>